This is where did the road go. Our aim is to explore the fringe, to be true skeptics and question openly, to investigate the paranormal, bring light to the dark corners of history, and give a voice to the shunned of science. We deal in mystery and the important questions that these subjects bring to light. What is reality? Who are we? And why are we here? Join us on the web at wheredidtheroadgo.com for a full show archive, links to all our social media, upcoming schedule, and much, much more. Now, join your host Soraya on this week's edition of Where Did the Road Go? And you're listening to Where Did the Road Go, obviously. Um, before we get into our interview tonight, I'm trying to remember to mention this. We do have a Patreon account. For only 3 bucks. you can get some extra content from the show. And uh, essentially, we're going to set up a membership area and, uh, for the moment, use Patreon to, uh, to work that. So uh, anyone who's already signed up got the extra stuff I did with Red Pill Junkie and Joshua Cutchin and Michael Hughes. And uh, that interview, that full interview early, which will probably be uh, published next week. So uh, tonight, however, I have for you the return of Melanie Zimmer. Hello. Hi there. And I always like when I can have people in studio. It's uh, much better than being on Skype or on the phone. <laughs> now, you've written a series of books from uh, about central New York and the Finger Lakes area, New York in general, right? Right, right. And you're, you're basically collecting stories. And one of the things I, I, I learned from these books is how much stuff actually started up here, what a rich history this area has. It's true. It's, it's really an amazing thing. And until I started uh, looking into and researching, I had no idea about the legendary and the uh, mythological history of, of the area. So it's, it's remarkable in, in how some of these things seem to um, make sense with what's going on folklorically elsewhere in the world. True, true. Um, and uh, your first book, which I just read this week, uh, Central New York and the Finger Lakes Myths, Legends, and Lore, uh, how did you get into writing this stuff? Um, well, I actually I was invited to write this book by the History Press. I I was a storyteller and puppeteer. I still am, and I had some articles online. And the History Press contacted me and said, "Would you be interested in writing a book about your area?" And um, I thought that was kind of exciting to do because I actually had uh, my own little folder of stories that I was collecting about the area. And I thought that um, obviously we'd have to put a lot more work into it and, and explore a lot more things. But mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, I thought the area had a lot to offer. And I, I was um, amazed because I knew it had a lot to offer, but I didn't realize how much it had to <laughs> offer. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And it has it has its, its share of uh, both like Indian legends and just... A lot of historical stuff that happened during the Civil War and and the Revolution and stuff like that. Yeah, there, there's so many stories, and, and a lot of them, um, one of the things I found in researching this first book was that um, a lot of times stories are very local. You know, they, they might uh, exist in, in one community and not reach into the next one. And so hmm. if you if you wander about long enough that you're going to have picked up a number of things that you really didn't know. And, and there, some of these stories are quite interesting. All right. And uh, one of the things I asked you to do for this show is to, to collect uh, stories of giants and little people because they're always popular uh, with people, especially with uh real giants so much in the uh, alternative news nowadays. Uh, so you went through and collected some of the Native American legends. Right. And, and these are, are Iroquois uh, stories. And um, um, so one of the one of the things that fascinated me was that there were stories of giants in the area. And um, one of the types of stories is, is called stone giants. Um, stone giants are um, a, a kind of creature. They're, they're they're tall and they're um, formidable and they're cannibalistic. And if you want, I can tell you briefly about how they came into being. Yes, absolutely. And this is according to the Iroquois. According, right, according to the Iroquois. Um, so <coughs> the, um, the legend says that there was a family and they were traveling on the western side of the Mississippi River. And um, which sounds like a long way from here, but this is, this is how these, these beings came to be. And um, they wanted to cross. 
and they found a, a strong vine, and somehow, I don't know how, they, the Mississippi's a pretty wide place, but they, they were said to um, be crossing one by one using this vine, and some of the people got across the river to the eastern side, and then the vine broke, and it split the family, so... Uh, most of the family was still on the western edge of the Mississippi, and then there was a smaller new group on the eastern side. And it became obvious to them fairly rapidly that um, they weren't going to be able to reunite with their family because the river was just too big and too wide. And so eventually those who crossed wandered off, and they really lost connection with who they really were. Uh, they lost their culture, and they began acting in, in very um, primitive ways. They began to, say, become cannibalistic, and they, they took up a, a strange custom, and that custom was rolling in the sand and covering their entire body with sand. Hmm. And what this would do is if anybody shot an arrow or a spear at them, it would repel it. And hmm. so, so they were these big, formidable, somehow they, they became large over time. I don't know how that happened, but um, they were these formidable, horrible people that went around that were impervious to weapons and attacked communities and ate people. <laughs> so that was, that was how the stone giants came to be. And, and that's interesting with, uh, as I was telling you before, the legends uh, out west of the cannibalistic giants and such. Uh, so it's a similar legend, probably with a different origin story. But there's probably the same truth behind it somewhere. Oh, maybe so. Maybe so. Um, yeah. So, um, the these um, stone giants were said to bother the Iroquois a great deal. In fact, um, originally, as you know, there are five Iroquois nations, and they were the the Mohawk and the um, Oneida and the uh, Onondaga and the Seneca and the Cayuga. Indians. And um, eventually, though, in the 1700s, the Tuscarora from North Carolina joined them. But even before they did, they were bothered by the stone giants, according to legend. And um, <laughs> so, um, so they say that, you know, they actually had to build their their communities um, as little fortresses to protect themselves against these these giants and for uh, for instance they would um, maybe be on a cliffside and they would make a, a ditch and it would put um, um, Spikes? tree yeah tree you know tree material tree trunks or whatever all along there to protect themselves so hmm. that's that's what it says hmm is that is that all that you had under the legends for those? No, oh. no, no. Actually, um, there's a there's a there's a lot of stories about about um, about the stone giants and and um, the the people the people down in um, the Tuscaroras um, they were so bothered by these giants who would um, attack them. Um, that um, actually, um, it, it, I'll tell you the story about the, how the giants ended, but I'm tell, I'll tell you a, a story that's rather um, entertaining and, and enlightening about the stone giants. It's, it's a tale of Scunny Wendy. And, and Scunny Wendy was um, a young man, and he was not that strong, and really he was not that brave, and... He wasn't that extraordinary, but he thought he was. And he, <laughs> and he spent all his time telling everybody how amazing he was. He was always telling people how brave he was and how strong and how, what a great warrior he was. And, and he would go on and on and, oh, the people were so tired of it. And people wanted to say something to him, but, you know, he was a trickster. Mm. And if you said something to him, then you would be the butt of a horrible practical joke. So, right. So people just kind of put up with it and, you know, they tried to tune him out. But one day he was he was standing in the middle of the village and he was telling everybody how wonderful he was. And he was the bravest, best warrior that there ever had been. And as he was talking, he didn't even notice, but one by one, the people were just slowly walking away <laughs> and they were going into the council house and, and and by the time he was done he looked around and he's like wow where did everybody go and and then he saw them coming out of the council house and 
And then um, one of the elders approached him and said, Scunny Wendy, uh, we have realized how brave and what a marvelous warrior you are. And because of this skill, we have decided you are the one who must face the stone giants <laughs> to prove your bravery to everyone. No, so Scunny Wendy had well, he hadn't anticipated this. <laughs> right. <laughs> and suddenly he wasn't feeling quite as brave as he thought he had been just a moment before. And and, and he said, um, well, I'm sure, uh, you know, when, when the giants see me, they'll run away for certain. <laughs> <laughs> well, the elder said, well, Scunny Wendy, um, there's actually a giant on the other side of the river right now. And we told him you were coming. So he was very angry and said he'd wait. <laughs> <laughs> so then Skinny Wendy really wanted out of this one, but all those people he'd been playing practical jokes on all that time were standing there staring at him, and he would have lost a lot of face had he not walked into the woods bravely, or not so much. <laughs> but as soon as he was in the woods, he started slowing down and walking slower and slower and, and thinking, oh my goodness, what am I going to do? Because... The giants, I mean, if I shoot my arrows at them, it will be repelled. And if I use my tomahawk, you know, it's not going to pierce their skin. And my weapons are no good at all. And he realized that he wasn't going to be able to use weapons to fight this battle. He would have to use his wits. And so he, um, he was like slowing down and slowing down. He finally decided to just hide behind a tree. <laughs> and as he was there, he kind of thought that maybe he should just tell everyone he wasn't going to do it because even though he'd make a fool of himself that at least he'd be alive <laughs> <laughs> right so he was thinking about doing this and he heard this boom 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 we peeks out behind the tree and why on the other side of the river there's this big stone giant and he's pulled up a tree and he's got the tree in his arms and he's swinging it back and forth well, the giant saw him, so his cover was totally blown, and he said, You are you scuddy one day. Well, get over here. You said you'd fight me. Ha, ha, ha. Everyone beats a stone giant. Well, scunny one day knew he was in trouble then, but he went over to the river, and he said, Yes, I am the great scunny one day. Come over here, and I will fight you with my tomahawk. And so... The giant, with his tree still in his hand, starts making his way into the river, and it's, it's rather deep there. So eventually he goes underwater, and while he goes underwater, Scunny Wendy decides he's going to run to the shallow part, run over the other side. <laughs> <laughs> and so when the giant surfaces, he's like, hey, coward, get back over here. He's like, well, you must have turned around when you're underwater. Come on over here and fight me. So again, he goes, you know, and again, he gets to that deep part and he goes underwater and, and well, Skinny Wendy runs to the other side quickly and he runs so quickly he forgets his tomahawk. <laughs> <laughs> so this time the giant comes out and he looks down. <clears throat> it's this some sort of toy and he holds it up to his mouth and he's testing the little blade on his tongue and he, and then he takes it and he, and he hits a boulder and it splits the boulder right in two. And like both of them are very surprised. But <laughs> Skinny Wendy's heard that the saliva of, um, of giants is magical. And now he realizes, in fact, that may be true. So um, he realizes his, his tomahawk's a pretty good weapon now against the stone <laughs> giant. So, so he hollers out to him, bring me my tomahawk and I'll cut off your head with it. Well, the giants are realizing that the tomahawk is actually a pretty formidable weapon now. And so he hollers out, No! No, Scuddy Wendy, I understand. You are, you, you're a great, great warrior, and let me live. Well, Scuddy Wendy stands on the bank, and he pretends to be considering this. And at last he um, says, All right, I'll let you go, but remember what a great warrior I am. And in <laughs> the this stone giant runs off into the woods and he doesn't bother them again. So, so Scunny Wendy goes and he picks up his tomahawk and he goes back into the village and he tells the people all of his story about how he outwitted the giant. And in fact, they were safe. They, they didn't uh, have any trouble from the giants again. <laughs> <laughs> so these, these stone giants, they, they, they've kind of all over the Iroquois legends. 
Oh, well, yeah, yeah it's actually, I mean, be, even before the um, Tuscarora came up, they were, um, to, to in the, they came up, I think, around 1722, if I'm mm -hmm. correct. And um, they came up kind of as a, um, under the protection of the Oneidas. They lived on Oneida land for a while until they found their own land. So um, they had been bothered in the Carolinas by stone giants um, mm. in and in fact, the the tale of how the stone giants end um, meet their end because apparently they're no longer around. Right. Um, starts down in the, the Carolinas. You know, they're down there harassing the <laughs> the, the um, Tuscaroras, and um, and they're bothering them so much that the holder of heavens comes down and decides he's going to have to take care of the situation. These these poor people are just too bothered by these giants. So he comes down and he assumes the form of a of a stone giant. Um, he transforms himself into a stone giant. He gets a big club and he goes and he finds the stone giants and then he leads them all up to um, near the Onondaga reser uh, uh, reservation area mm -hmm. or Onondaga territory, as it were, at the time. And, um, and he tells them all that, you know, they're going to rest underneath this hill uh, because they are going to attack in the morning at first light. That's what that's what the plan is. They're going to attack the Adonadagas at first light. So they all lay down and the holder of heaven goes up into the hills and causes a big avalanche. It covers up all the giants and hmm. they all meet their end that way. Now, uh, where is the Onondaga nation territory? Um... <laughs> Okay, so um, y you know where 690 is? Well, it's, it's over by Syracuse. Oh, okay. That's where it is. Okay, all right. Yeah. I was, um, was going to, because as I was telling you earlier, there were a bunch of giant skeletons found around Niagara Falls, and that would have been an interesting correlation there. Yeah. Well, I mean, this, uh, the Seneca would have been, the Seneca Cuyahuca would have been somewhere over there, too. So, hmm. I would. I sh I, we should also tell people you're, 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 one of the things you do is that you're a storyteller for children. I, yes, I, I do tell stories for you, children. And uh, you yeah. have a puppet show and... Right, a Dancing Bear Puppet Theater, and I'm um, sorry, I'm itinerant. I go to different places, and I perform puppet theater for for children. Okay, all right. Because you you, to, you told that story like a storyteller would tell the story. That's why I wanted to clear that for, <laughs> for people if they're a little like, what what's happening here? <laughs> um, yeah. So that is something you've been doing for a very long time, too, isn't it? Oh, yes. Um, I don't know. I, you don't ask me how many years. I've um, um, forgotten. <laughs> uh, I, I know it's more than 17, so that would be a while. Nice. Nice. And you have a website for that, too, if people I are interested? I do. It's, it's www.thepuppets.com. Okay. And that's, puppets are plural. And your books are also linked on there, right? They are. The, all the four books. There's The Myth, Legend, and Lore of Central New York. The Finger Lakes, The Curiosities of Central New York. Forgotten Tales of New York and Curiosity of the Finger Lakes. So they're all up there if anybody would like to see them. Okay. Eventually, do you plan on doing another one? Um. Well, it may be so, but I haven't, it's, it's not on the table right now. <laughs> right, right. But it's not impossible. It's not impossible, no. <laughs> <laughs> all right. Are you still collecting stories? Uh, yeah. I mean, when I, when I go out and I find things, I mean, that's the thing, uh, you know, when I first started the first book, um, I think I was really helped by the fact that I was an itinerant puppeteer because I'd go to from place to place. And sometimes people tell me the stories that are relevant for their location. And that's how I got my little collection together to start with. So, so it's kind of nice when you're traveling from, you know, to different areas because you really get a different perspective. Okay. Um, how about uh, some of the stories of little people? Okay, so so there are um, stories of little people. Um, the I know the the Iroquois did have stories of, of little people, and um, and they still do. In fact, there are still people who s have cited them. Um, little people are not really um, confined to just the Iroquois. I mean, they seem to be popping up all over the place. Mm -hmm. And you know, as we know, we have like little people like leprechauns and such in Ireland and, and actually and people have seen like leprechaun like creatures here as well um, that I've met <laughs> there's, um, there's also uh, I don't know if it's this area. I think it's more toward the northeast of here uh, the Pukwudgies are one of the, the names of one of the little people oh really yeah so yeah well, this, this um, the Iroquois have um, um, 
it's I guess there's kind of a prohibition about talking about little people because um, they're considered unlucky. It's mm-hmm. unlucky to see one. Um, I don't think it's, it's necessarily unlucky to see one, but the tradition is that it's unlucky to see one because um, they they can be kind of testy. And, um, <laughs> <laughs> and if you get on their wrong side, you know, bad things can happen to you. Um, apparently there's also a prohibition about, you know, telling stories about little people because um, in, in the summer you know, in the time when you would be working, doing your work and harvesting things mm-hmm. and the stories that um, if you do, according to Parker, who um, was a Seneca, that um, if you tell stories and uh, of them in the wrong time, um, you can find that you might get all your lips stung by a hundred bees or find a bunch of snakes in your bed who will strangle and suffocate you or whatever. So so nasty things can happen to you if hmm. you do the wrong thing. So you always want to please them. Um, so first of all, um, we know that um, from description of the little people from the Iroquois that they're not dressing, of course, like leprechauns. They're dressing like... Native American people might be wearing, you know, leather and pants or whatever. Right, right, you. right. Whatever the and culture is. Possibly, yeah. no, possibly no clothes at all. There have been some seen with no clothes at all. They tend to be about a foot in height, so they're quite small. Mm-hmm. Um, they are magical creatures. They're, you know, not natural creatures, magical creatures. Um, they are... They are found in natural areas like wooded areas or bushy areas they don't find them at the mall (laughs) right right Um, so so i think they there's been a decline in people seeing them and in in part that could be because you know people used to be out hunting and gathering and growing food and now they're sitting in offices and working on computers but (laughs) but but people do still see them and i have met some who's, who's actually seen um, these little people. And um, so there are um, stories about them, um, despite the fact that, you know, people don't want to talk, you know, too much about them because it can be considered unlucky. Um, if you disrespect them, if you don't want to get them on your bad side right, because, right. you know, bad things will happen to you. Um, your crops could fail. I mean, who knows what could happen. Um, people who cite little people, oftentimes they're young Young people, um, more often, um, I mean, so older people can see them too, but you know, more often it's young people, often older, older people hear them or mm. hear their water drums. And, um, and so there's, um, you know, the tradition, if you, if you hear them or you hear the water drums, you might want to offer them some tobacco. Um, one of the things I read that was kind of strange, but um, that you could offer them fingernail clippings hmm. and they use that <laughs> to that I, I found this part a little odd but I mean that they could use that to bathe with them so they assume the smell of a human and it helps them hunting huh, so the animals don't run away from them or um, so so they're they're fairly powerful little creatures I mean very strong very strong the fact they're they're small they can uproot things and you know do a lot of things in nature that you don't want to mess with um so um if you want i could tell you a story about a a little person yeah but first my question i don't know if you're going to know the answer is are there any uh any legends of them giving food or taking food from people um they um, they're i think legend has it that they can help with the crops and help They've, I think, um, one story that I know that you know they they help give information about about the natural world to help people get food, hmm. you know, so you know what to eat, what to pick, what you know, what plants are okay and what plants are not okay. Huh. Um, so, I mean, if you um, if you are respectful, they can be helpful to you. But if you if you ignore them or if you are disrespectful to them, you you could have you know your crops fail, for instance. Okay. Yeah. Go ahead with the the story there. I would say so. There's a um, a story of um, a little person, and the story's called "Dirty Clothes," and it's about a young man who um, has lost his parents, and so he lives with his uncle, and his uncle's not um, very generous with him, and so he basically dresses him in rags, and so the people of the village call him "Dirty Clothes." That's his hmm. name. 
And, um, n- you know, nonetheless, the boy has a very good heart. And he he holds dear, you know, what his mother tells him that, you know, if you, if you walk with good in your heart, then you're, you don't have to be afraid. And um, so one day, um, this well, also despite the fact that Dirty Clothes is um, a little bit neglected, he is a good hunter. He's, he's a very uh, good shot. And so one day he was out hunting, and he um, he had already shot a couple squirrels, and he he saw a black squirrel in a tree, and then he noticed like a little arrow that just flew by and missed it. And then he heard a little voice down below, Yeah, you missed it. You better shoot again. You know, and he looks down, and there's <laughs> these two little diminutive men. And... Um, and he realized that the, the little guy is not going to be able to shoot the squirrel like like he is. And so he takes his, his bow and arrow and he, in fact, shoots the squirrel. The squirrel falls to the ground. And the little guys gather around and say, you know, who shot this? And, and you know, he admits that he did it. And he said, like, he said well, it was a good shot. The squirrel is, is yours. You can take it. And he says, no, no, you take it. And... And they're so delighted by that that um, they invite him home and mm. to come with him so they can honor him and, and thank him um, with some hospitality and teach him some things. So he follows the young, uh, with two the little people, to the river. And there is a, a canoe there, and they hop in. But unfortunately, the canoe is only... <laughs> a tiny little canoe, and and Dirty Clothes is afraid that if he steps in it, he's just going to sink the whole thing, that he can't even fit in it. It's so small. and the, But the men keep beckoning him, and so he puts his foot in the canoe, and instantly he's a tiny little man. Hmm. And then they put their paddles in the water, and instead of sailing down the the river, they go into the sky, up to the cliffs where the little people were living. And they introduce him to their um, their friends, the other little people, and and they thank him for all that he has given the little squirrel that he's he'd shot for them, and and they they ask him, you know, to stay a while because they want to teach him some things, and and he stays, he stays four days, and and then he he starts to think, you know, this is so nice, but. I don't live here. I live in the village and I actually should go home at some point here. So he tells them, you know, that it's really time for me to head back. And, and they say, okay, well, we'll take you. And he, um, he follows them through the woods and on the way they start teaching him so many things. They teach him about squash and corn and they show them the strawberries that can be eaten. And, and along the way, they also teach him a dance and the dance is, um, um, interesting dance because it's it's done in the dark and the reason it's done in the dark is because um, then the little people can come and join you and mm. it's your way to thank the little people for the things that they have done and so he finally um, arrives at the village and he looks back to thank the men and they're gone I mean they're just not there and so he walks into the village and it's his own village you can see that but it's also different and um He's not sure quite why, but he he runs across a woman he knows, and, and she comes up to him and says, Welcome, but who are you? <laughs> and he's like, Did you know me? I'm dirty clothes. You know me. And, and she's like, she looks at him. She's like, Look at your clothes. You're so fine. He's wearing these fine leather clothes with embroidery. And she says, You're not dirty clothes. You're so fine. He says, you're a, you're a man, and you look at these wonderful clothes you're wearing. So he asks where um, his uncle's house is, and she's like, oh, why do you want to know that? He's, you know, a man like you. Why would you want to be with a man like that? And he says, he's my uncle. And she says, he died long ago. <laughs> and um, so at that point, he, he gathers the villagers around, and he tells them what happened to him in... The things that he learned, the things that the little people taught him, and um, and he teaches them the dark dance, so they can do it to give thanks to the little people. Hmm. Yeah, the connections between that and like the the fairy faith over in uh, 
Celtic countries and even the UFO phenomena are very, very, like the archetype there is, is it's the same. <laughs> and that's just fascinating. Yeah, uh, there's some interesting similarities with the, the lost time. Yeah. And the, you know, the, the existence of little people and, and well, the even, magical powers. Even the teaching about plants, when you look at shamans in the, the rainforest, the, when they, they make ayahuasca, they say, you know, if anyone says, how did you learn to make this? Because it's such an unusual uh, combination of plants, they'll say, well, the plants told us. <laughs> so, I don't know. Uh, we got to take a quick break, and we'll be back in, uh, with Melanie Zimmer. Where did the road go can be heard first and usually live on WVBR Saturday nights at 11 p.m. Eastern. Go to WhereDidTheRoadGo.com to ask questions of our live guests through the chat room. Where Did The Road Go is then re-aired on Dark Matter Radio and Deprogrammed Radio. You can download all shows for free on the website, and you can subscribe to us on Stitcher, iTunes, YouTube, or Vimeo. Additional content can be found on our video channels. You will also find our upcoming schedule, book reviews, blogs, free book downloads, links, and more. We are also on Facebook and Twitter, and if you want to help support the show, there are links to donate to us. Everything you need can be found at WhereDidTheRoadGo.com. And we also have a Patreon account now, which you can find at wheredidtheroadgo.com, right on the main page. If you want to become a member of the site, there'll be a member section up sometime in the next few weeks with links to all the extra stuff I'm putting up for Patreons. We're also going to be trying to make merchandise with the money. Um, and then if you're a patron, you'll get it cheap or some stuff you'll probably just get for free. But we'll get to all that as it happens. And uh, tonight we've been talking with Melanie Zimmer. Hello. Hi. <laughs> and uh, we've been talking about giants and little people, but you have an interesting hoax in this first book as far as giants go. Oh, right. The Cardiff giant. And I think I think that's probably everyone's favorite hoax. The bigger, biggest hoax in New York State, they say. Um, so the, Cardiff, the story of the Cardiff giant actually starts in Iowa, strangely enough. Um, there was a, a cigar maker, and his name was George Hall. And he went to visit his sister in Iowa, and she had at that time um, a Reverend Turk, who was a Methodist minister, staying at her house at that time. And Hall and Reverend Turk got into some heated discussions. <laughs> we'll just call them discussions, but Reverend Turk believed in interpreting the Bible very literally. And because of that, he, um, you know, he believed a lot of things that Hall was doing were um, wrong. And basically he told Hall he would burn in hell. <laughs> and Hall, Hall, because Hall didn't read the Bible regularly, he wasn't going to church regularly, and he had um, that nice new book on, on um, by Charles Darwin that he was reading. So um, a Turk ended by quoting Genesis about giants walking across the earth and George Hall was so fed up, he, he left in a fit of anger, and he swore to himself that he would get his revenge. And, and apparently he was a patient man, because for two years he plotted what he was going to do. <laughs> <laughs> and he discovered that in Iowa there was a limestone quarry, and it had these little blue veins running through the limestone that kind of looked like human veins. Hmm. So he, he paid a couple of guys a barrel of beer to quarry out enough limestone, and we are talking like 3,000 pounds of limestone here. <laughs> I think they got a raw deal on that one. Yeah. Um, and, and he um, shipped it off to Chicago, where he hired a sculptor. <laughs> And had him make a giant, you know, this uh, basically a giant, uh, a, a stone giant, right? A stone giant <laughs> that was was reclining, and in some ways, it he he had it make it, it so it would pass for real, but in some ways, it was so in your face, blatant that you don't you wonder how anybody could have believed it. Um, for instance, he. At first, they had hair and a beard on the giant, but then he discovered that hair and beards don't really fossilize, fossilize. well. So, yeah, yeah so he, he, he had that taken off. And they made this little tool out of a darning needle so they could poke it all over the place and look like 
like pores on the skin, <laughs> um, not realizing that skin didn't actually fossilize. Right. And um, he he had the face made to look like his own. That's the blatant <laughs> part, right? <laughs> so so that wasn't good enough, though. It it, it still it looked kind of white, shiny, and new. Mm-hmm. And so they took ink wash and they poured it all over you know to make it look darker and Mm -hmm. then and then they took a sulfuric acid and they went over this to make it look really old and then he um he put it on a train and brought it up to new york state and it got off and and it got onto a wagon and it was in this big copper or casket really that you know so you couldn't see it but right. but he still he 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 shipped it at night because he didn't want anybody to see anything going by sure and so a couple of people apparently saw this going by in Tully but you know they they didn't know what it was they told him it was farm equipment or something like that right right and eventually it goes up to William Newell's farm in Cardiff and they they plant it you know they bury it behind the barn and then they wait a year. <laughs> so, I mean, we're talking very patient here. Yeah. So, and year is up. Then it's, it's William Newell's, it's his, his, um, his um, farm there. It's his, his turn to take action here. So he's supposed to get the thing dug up. So he, he hires a couple well diggers. And then he, he gets his divining rod, and he spends the whole day going all over his farm. And finally, at the end of the day, he <laughs> discovers, oh, the water must be here behind the barn. But, you know, it's getting kind of late. And they did this on a Friday, you know. We don't know if it was they actually planned this so it would be you know people don't have time to come and see it or what on saturday but so saturday morning the well diggers come back and they're digging and well they don't dig very far and three feet under they hit a stone foot so um you know people the word spreads that you know something's going on over the newell farm so people start coming by they're digging up this thing finally they uncover it and people are wondering what is it you know it could be Oh, you know, it could it could be a statue left by the Jesuits, or or maybe it's um, um, maybe it's a giant, like a fossilized giant, maybe from the Bible, or some people thought, you know, it was one of the legendary giants from the Iroquois because right. they apparently were buried, you know, by legend over near Syracuse. Well, the sure. Cardiff is nearby. So on um, all of these theories, and there were some naysayers too, but they were in the, the distinct minority, and you know, and the the odd thing was that people just kept coming and coming. So they put a little canopy over it, and they started charging money. But there were so many people coming; they raised the price. <laughs> And within like a day, there's a stagecoach coming from Syracuse, just bringing people to the Newell farm. And, and you know, they're making money right over left on this thing. Well, um, after a while, George, um, George Hall's thinking, you know, I got to get out of this while the getting's good, you know. <laughs> so he sells a part of it to some respectable businessmen in Syracuse. I mean, we're talking like two ex mayors here and so you know, and and so um and he, he gets an offer from from P. T. Barnum because P. T. Barnum right. because he's got the business, you know, people are coming to see this. And, and I think P. T. Barnum offered some obscene amount of money, like fifty five thousand dollars, which like back then that's a lot that's a yeah, lot of money today. Yeah. But I mean, imagine then it was like a <laughs> You know, fortune and well, he knew he could make it back with it. Yeah, but like he turns them down. So, so anyway, the um the new guys who have the you know partial ownership in this thing, they decide they're going to move it to New York after it's been around here for a while, so they can get I guess more more customers, and they put it up. And yeah, people are coming in droves to see it. Well, Peter Barman's kind of pissed off because he didn't get the right, get right. the thing, so he couldn't get the genuine object. So he has some hack make a plaster copy of it, and it's not even very good. So he puts it up in his place down the road. I mean, at some point they were just down the road from each other, and. He puts a sign in the window or wherever that says, you, it's $1,000 you'll get if you could prove this is a, a real Cardiff giant. <laughs> so, of course, people are flocking to see this this uh, plaster cast or P.T. Right. Barnum's got rather than the real thing, the quote, real thing down, <laughs> the, down real the road. Fake. Yeah. So, so anyway, 
Uh, eventually, the um, the businessmen who own the Cardiff Giant decide they're going to sue P.T. Barnum for making this fake and telling everybody it's real. And and, and so P.T. Barnum goes to court, and he actually wins the case when he tells them, is it really illegal to make a fake of a fake? You know. <laughs> <laughs> so... Um, Anyway, the um, Cardiff Giants, it was an ex- extraordinary hoax, and, and Hall went on to try to make another hoax in Colorado. <laughs> of course. I don't know if it had the same intention, like, I'll get them, you know, with, right. with some chimpanzee bones or something. And, well, sure, probably trying to make money off uh, of it like uh, he did this yeah, one. Yeah, I know. It was apparently real profitable. All his labors and patience paid off, but... Um, but that wasn't very successful. But anyway, the Cardiff Giant today resides at the um, in Cooperstown at the Farmers Museum, so you can actually oh. see the Cardiff Giant today. Nice. And um, yeah, yeah. So it's a, it's a good piece of um, New York State history. <laughs> yeah. All right. Uh, well, the other major thing I wanted to get to, and most people probably know this, but Mormonism started here in New York State. Um, it did. It's uh, over in the Palmyra area, actually. I always thought it was Elmira for some reason. Elmira, no, no, no. It was over, huh. over. I don't know why I thought that, but. <laughs> no, it's just north of the uh, thruway going okay. going west. All right. And yeah. you, you want to tell us kind of the brief version of that? Because that, that's. There is no I, brief version. Yeah, I know there's no totally <laughs> brief version. There is no. This is. The, no. So. So. Um, so. Joseph Smith's family, they, they were farmers and shopkeepers in, in Vermont, actually. Mm-hmm. And they, they went bust because they, they got ripped off, actually. So they, they sold some jinxum to a ship captain who totally didn't pay them. And, and also, um, the year they moved here, a lot of people were coming to New York from Vermont because it, the year without a summer, their crops failed and mm. things were bad and people lost money. And, and they were selling land cheap out out near Palmyra in New York. Okay. So, so, so people and who wanted to... When, when was that, roughly? Um, oh, dear, you're testing my memory of, <laughs> of the date here. It's in the 1800s, yeah. and I, I, I can tell you here in a second. I just say, yeah. Um, not not that out, important. Yeah. Anyway, they, the family came out, and they were, you know, basically almost penniless. I mean, 1816, they came out. Um, so... That was early in the 1800s. That was, of course, that was the year without a summer. I should have known that, right? So they they came out here and they bought some land and they cleared the land and and um, they were a, a religiously uh, divided family. The um, the mother and um, several other people in the family were Presbyterians, and the father didn't go to church, and neither did young Joseph. They believed in just reading. They weren't. They were religious. They just wanted to read the Bible at home and and interpret things. And they would have these prophetic dreams. Hmm. And um, so, it was a time of a lot of revivals in the area, and there was a lot of religious activity. And he began to um, question what you know. What is the right thing? What is the right religion? What's you know? What is all this stuff going on? And what what should I really be doing um, religiously? And and, um, you know, so he, he had gone out and he had uh, prayed over this thing and had a, um, he had a vision and the vision said that there was a, a robed figure involved in, and, and it said um, that all those religions were in fact wrong. Right, right. And he, he told the, the local minister who shunned him. <laughs> <laughs> Not surprisingly. Yeah. No, he, was, he wasn't impressed with this vision at all. And um, so anyway, um, at, at a, a slightly later date, in his, in his room, which was kind of in the garret, they lived in a very, very small home. And, and the, I guess the kids were upstairs in what is kind of like an attic area. Right. And um, in fact, I think they, they have, um, they had two homes. They had a really like a starter home and then a, a little less starter home. <laughs> it's just a little <laughs> bit bigger. And one of them, I think, is was uh, recreated by the Mormons, and the other is the original. So you hmm. you can actually see where the, he lived, at least one of the two homes. And um, so he was in bed, and he had a vision, and the vision told him um, that 
the speaker was name was Maroney. Was, uh, right. And um, he um, he was going to um, actually uncover these golden plates that were hidden, but not yet. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> not yet. One, and, of, one and, of the first odd things about the story, not yet. <laughs> <laughs> and yeah, Well, the, the, the second odd thing is that this, the same scene plays over like three times in succession yeah. the whole night. Yeah. You know, he keeps having the same vision again and again. And, and he's going to, um, you know, have to obey the word of God and so on. And, and anyway, um, with time <laughs> he eventually he eventually the time comes when he is to dig up these plates it was supposed to be on basically what we today call hill camora mm. and and it's it's a drumlin and it has it apparently had at that time like a rock at the time and he was like lifting up the rock with a, a lever and underneath right. was this case with these golden plates with this unintelligible an interpretable language glyph on or, it. Yeah. I, I don't know what it, <laughs> yeah. So, um, and he's not supposed to let anybody see them. Mm -hmm. And so, so, uh, in the next part of the story, he, he, you know, brings these back to the house, but people get, catch wind of that. And they, people start raiding the house and searching, you know, busting into their home and, you know, looking all over for these golden plates and nobody, nobody really seen them, you know? Right. Um, but, Eventually, he's supposed to interpret this, and he um, he has a, a, he marries a, a woman named Emma, and uh, that he met when he was treasure hunting. Yeah, I think this story is like layers, layers upon <laughs> layers upon layers. Right? Yes. He had he used to have a, like a what do you call it, a peep stone? Yeah, that was interesting. I didn't yeah, actually peeps, know that a peep stone, which was like a a little rock that somehow allowed him to see other times and places and things that other people can't see. And he would go and hire out as a treasure hunter. And, uh, but they called it a money digger then. And I think mm -hmm. it was illegal to do that money digging because he got, um, I guess there's some sort of vague court record that he was hauled in. Oh yeah. Money digging yeah. And, and, um, but anyway, he met his future wife while they were staying at this person's house. Um, they rented some rooms there, I guess, and while he was money digging. So he eventually takes the plates and goes down, and he's going to interpret them using these two odd tools that came with the kit, you know, yeah. basically. Um, and, but he then abandons them and goes back to the peep stone. He would put the peep stone in his hat and put his head in his hat and then like would somehow interpret with his head in his hat looking at the peep <laughs> yeah. stone what was on the plates. Now, now Joseph Smith was pretty illiterate. I mean, he wasn't totally illiterate because they read the Bible at home. Right, they, his, right. The family did read the Bible, um, but he had no schooling. They couldn't afford it. Really. Right, yeah. They, they, they were poor. And um, so he couldn't actually write the interpretation. So his wife, you know, did the writing and he would look in the hat. And then he would ask God if that was true. And if God said yes, then, then they would write it down. So anyway, it's 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 a very complicated story. And it, it involves a, also a man... His last name was Martin, and he lived in the area, and he wanted to give some money to him. So, um, so it could be published, right? Right. Well, to to help with that, and then eventually it became so it could become published, and 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 you know his wife became rather suspicious that, that Martin's wife, um, because no one was allowed to see the play. Sure. And so you know they're giving this money, and they didn't know if if it's real if they're being hoaxed or they're yeah. going to lose their farm over it and and so um you know she wanted to know and 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 supposedly joseph smith had a vision that you know basically god scolding martin you better give this money and blah 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 <laughs> um so um so martin does and his wife does leave him and they do end up 
you know, mortgaging the farm and, you know, yeah. and, but, but it gets published, um, which is a story in itself, but it gets published in Palmyra. And actually the, they do have, it's kind of like a little museum there where they, it was first published hmm. um, and stuff was being leaked out, you know, t somehow. Right, right. At that time. So people so, wouldn't have to buy it. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Er, er, like, early piracy. Yeah, very <laughs> early piracy. Um, now, he did let other people see the plates eventually. He he did. It's it's a very odd thing because um, I guess, um, he, you know, no one was supposed to see them. And then, you know, God said that they could. And then, and then some the people signed... Uh, statement saying they saw them and then some people reneged and said they didn't really you know and so i don't know uh, <laughs> what happened but but yes the there were two groups of a couple groups of people that were allowed to see these plates hmm. so anyway it's um it's an interesting tale it's, it's um yeah you, it, have a, you have a ton more detail on this book about that the whole story of how this came about, which I mean, I knew bits and pieces of it. I didn't realize how how many layers there were to it. Oh yeah, and you, you could actually once a year in July, um, the Mormons have a they call it a pageant, I believe, and, and they actually recreate you know some scenes from the Book of Mormon coming down the hill of, of Cumorah. Hmm. So there's that there. And I mean, obviously, it's become a bit of a powerhouse religion for a small religion. Yeah, well, it's very big in Utah. So. Well, yes, yeah. Um, so let's let's go on to the the one you really like here. Um, I can't pull up my list. Oh dear. Um, I can't say I had her. The autocorrect oh. spelled her name wrong. Not oh, Katrina. Oh yes, okay, but. okay. So like, like, oh, I like several of them. <laughs> okay, it's like, okay, so um, we have had when I wrote this book, which a, a few years back. And I, I just looked at 2008, 2008. That was my yeah. first book. Um, I had gone to um, the Kateri Shrine, which is in Fonda. And um, um, Kateri Tekawatha was a was blessed at that time. Um, so I'll tell you a bit about her story. And, and then I'll tell you a bit about the shrine. If I have time. You have time. Have time. Go ahead. Okay. Um, so... Um, Kateri was actually a, um, a girl who was, uh, whose father was a Mohawk warrior and her mother was an Algonquin, but her mother was a Christian. So, mm. um, she was a bit exposed to Christianity and unfortunately at age four, um, a smallpox epidemic wiped out a, a lot of the village and in, in, including her mother, her father and her brother. And mm. so at four, she was orphaned and. And um, she was given to her uncle to raise, and her uncle was of the Turtle Clan. And he did raise her, and of course, when the time came, he came to look for suitors, and she would, you know, hide in the cornfields because she didn't want to marry. And um, she was became very interested in Christianity. And um, eventually, she came across um, a Jesuit who who baptized her, and, and he baptized her at the. Um, spring that's still there at near the Kateri shrine in in the um in the ravine mm -hmm. um so she became a christian and at that point the people in the village began to shun her and they shunned her um uh, her uncle especially was very anti-christian and the reason i mean there really was a reason for it and the reason was um everywhere the jesuits went their disease broke out <laughs> right well sure so and th that's why they had the smallpox epidemic yeah. because they you know the the missionaries came and you know and then the smallpox ended up going through the village and, right. and mysteriously the jesuits were never affected yeah <laughs> because they had immunity exactly yeah. so you know they they um there were a lot of feelings that you know among people that they might be sorcerers etc so mm -hmm. um so she was uh, treated very badly after that. In fact, um, the people refused to use her name. They called her she, her her name when she, when she became a Christian became Kateri, it, and it, mm. it, which is Catherine, and uh, people wouldn't use her name. They they called her a Christian, mm. and then um, 
she wouldn't work on the Sabbath anymore. And so they would hide all the food. So she would have, they would think she'd go into the, you know, fields to, you know, right, right, gather to work, food. Yeah. And, and no, but that didn't happen. And, and they did some really horrible things. One woman had started a rumor about her that she had sinned with her husband. And, and someone actually um, went into her quarters with an ax and pretended to murder her. I mean, it was like really, really getting horrible. So, um, she she actually um, spoke to um, a priest, and he said, "Well, I think the thing for you to do is you pray a lot, and you should leave." <laughs> Which seems actually like sound advice at that point. Yeah. <laughs> so, um, she I had to wait for a while, but eventually she found a. Um, someone going north his name was hot ashes and she went with a letter of introduction to um to a mission up in um uh, canada Mm -hmm. and there she she met a woman her name was uh mary Teresa, and they became very very close and um oh i should have mentioned um when the smallpox epidemic hit she became scarred on her face she got right. scars and she op- I knew there was something that right. i couldn't remember she, what it was she was partially blinded so when it when the sun was bright she would put a blanket over her head so she, it would shade her eyes mm. so um when she got there um she and mary Teresa really connected mary Teresa was an oneida and um and they began um you know, she, Mary Teresa taught her things about Christianity, but they also um, both felt bad that they had spent part of their life not as Christians, living mm-hmm. in this Indian way, and they decided they wanted to do penance for that. They yeah. were told to do penance for that, but they decided on their own that this was something they were going to do. And so she would, you know, like whip herself with uh, willow branches and burn her between her toes and her feet and walk on jagged ice and walk through snow up to her knees and bare feet and things of that nature. Wow. And yeah, and then they would lock themselves in the chapel and they would whip each other till they bled and, you know, telling Jesus, we want to suffer with you. And, and so um, eventually she confessed this to the priest and he was surprised and probably kind of horrified (laughs) yeah but he said you know you probably shouldn't be doing these things and but she wanted to anyway so she did continue some austerities and unfortunately um she um it was um like holy week and she had um just been sick she decided she was going to fast and she was lying on thorns (laughs) And she, she died. Yeah. And um, a number of people were present. Um, uh, there was a room full of, of Indians who witnessed and um, also two Jesuits who witnessed this. And they said 15 minutes after she died, the, all the smallpox scarring on her face disappeared and she looked radiant and glorious. So, hmm. um, so then um, – a number of people who were there were uh, um, had experienced some miracles, and um, I guess 50 years later, a, a, a mission started in Mexico, and there they Mexico, prayed. New York. No, or Mex- okay, Mexico. All right, <laughs> yeah, Mexico. I, they, I believe Mexico, Mexico, and um, and they um, were praying for her sainthood. So I mean, and this happened in the 1600s. This is very early. This is you know right, right. So. So she's been waiting a long time for her sainthood, <laughs> but and she she became um, blessed in uh, 1980 with Pope John Paul, and then um, in 2012, so it's a very recent. She was sainted hmm. um, in in October in October, and um, she became the first Native American saint. Wow! So. Um, no, no, don't, don't, no worry, don't, don't worry about it. Go oh, on. Okay. So, <laughs> so she, um, it, it's, it's, it's really interesting. When I, when I visited the shrine uh, for this book, she was blessed. And so mm-hmm. she wasn't a saint. And um, the shrine is actually right off the thruway, the thruway being 90. Mm-hmm. And um, you get off of Fonda and then there's signs. And it's really easy to find. And it, this shrine was run by just three um, Franciscan monks, huh. and um, and they they 
kind of knew that, you know, she was going to be, I don't know how they knew. I mean, I mean, suppose one could be blessed for a century and still right, not right. be sainted, but, but they had the, the idea that she was going to be sainted soon. And so they, they felt like they were preparing the place and, you know, making this better because they were expecting more people right. when this happened. And, um, it's it's really a lovely um, it's a lovely chapel because it's it's unlike anything I've seen before. Um, she was a very um, she was very adverse to wearing say jewelry or anything yes like that. Yeah. you know she would never wear something just for decorative purposes and and um, the the chapel is is so it's like it's a rustic chapel. Hmm. It's, it's very beautiful and it's it's all just like wood and you know very very simple and and somehow I, I feel like that that is the appropriate thing there's a lot of grounds involved in fact there's um um a place there's there's a small museum with some archaeological uh, relics from the uh, village that's there hmm. there's um i think the remains, if you call it that, I and mean, there's not a lot of remains, but there's evidence of like the oldest longhouse in oh, the okay. area, and it's all staked out where you can see it. And if you go down into the ravine, you can find that spring where um, Kateri was baptized on Easter, you mm-hmm, know, back mm-hmm. in the 1600s. So it's a really interesting place. And um, are, in, there, are there supposed to be healings there too? Um. At, at the spring, yeah, I'm not. You know, I don't. I don't. I'm not oh, sure. Okay. Um, I. I mean, it, it. It could be. I don't know because a, a number of people, um, at least the time that she lived, claimed um, miracles. They they experienced miracles, so it's possible that you know. So these, this, but I I didn't actually discuss that with anybody. Ah, so I okay. don't want. I don't want to. I don't want right. to say <laughs> something that's not true. Um, but um, but but that 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 is her story, and and um, it's, it's it's a rather interesting one. So you know, yeah. she she ends up being the first um, Native American saint. Hmm. All right. Um, earlier, I was going to mention you, you also write in here that your husband had a encounter with someone who was looking for treasure, or oh, uh, oh yeah. I I think it, um, he did come home from work one day, and he had been in Utica, and. And he um, he did encounter, and this is this actual live person. It's not, it's not like I don't think he's a real leprechaun, but um, a man with um, painted yellow ears, and um, and yes, he was <laughs> looking for leprechaun treasure. <laughs> so I wonder if yeah, he found it. <laughs> that I don't know. He claimed that it was under the tree that he was near. So my husband did not take a shovel to it. <laughs> and it could still be there today. <laughs> um, the other two stories I wanted to get to real quick are just more uh, amusing things. There was a guy trying to sn- sell snow dye. <laughs> um, I, I, I'll mention his name because I know he won't mind. And um, he's, I think he's up in the Watertown now. His name is Ron Dealey. And oh, so this, I, this is not that far in the past then. No, 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 no. Um, I had been working on some stories that... Um, um, from the Erie Canal, and mm-hmm. he knew that I, he knew I was interested in the Empeyville Frog, and he had actually lived in that area, so he had some tales of, that he he used to tell about the Empeyville Frog, and he then told me the story of Snow Dye, and he said, you know, this is, this is a place we have nothing more if we have. We have snow. I mean, right. we, have, we have boundless snow. And, <laughs> and he was living in the Camden area, and it was like the Tug Hill Plateau. And, you know, you can't get more snow than that. So he decided that this was um, a major resource that we had. And probably it is. If you if you ask Texas or California today, they sure, probably sure. would like our snow. <laughs> <laughs> but his idea was that we were going to harvest it and and extract white snow dye from it and, and use it to make everything sparkly clean. <laughs> Obviously that failed for some reason. <laughs> yeah, for, some, for some strange reason. <laughs> can't, can't, can't fault them for trying, I guess. No, no. And the other interesting one was the uh, one you have titled A Whale of a Tail. A Whale of a Tail. This is a true story. As weird as it is, I there is evidence of this story. <laughs> um. Um, this story is supported by a poster that still exists mm. and is in reprint, and I think you can buy it up in Seneca Falls. This story was told to me by 
um, Doris Wolf and Francis Caraccio. I hope he's pronouncing his last name right because Doris was actually my my um, informant, ah. <laughs> so I know how to pronounce her name. <laughs> um, so. In 1888, um, there was a whale that was killed. And we don't actually know where it was killed. Some people say that a whaler killed a, a whale in Boston uh, um, um, off the Cape. I'm, and, and then some people say it, well, it actually, a, a boat collided with a whale in, mm. in the Boston Harbor, or excuse me, New York Harbor. But um, at any rate, there was a whale. <laughs> <laughs> right. It was a very, very large whale. It weighed uh, tons, and, and it was um, uh, normally at that at that point in history, people would take a whale and then you'd sell it for you you know reduce it to whale oil and people use right, it for lamps. Right. But this was not the fate of that whale. In fact, what happened is um, they just say they were going to make it into an exhibition hall. And they needed money for this because they had to buy a whole lot of embalming fluid. Yeah. This thing, <laughs> this thing was immense. So they they cut out the tongue, and they sold it, you know, to get money for. Um, um, they, ma- they the had that made into yeah. whale oil, so then they could sell that and make the, get the embalming fluid. And they embalmed the whale, and they and they cut out, I guess, part of the jaw area, and they made it into a dining area. <laughs> so. <laughs> Um, you could actually, they say, um, you could have 25 people inside the whale's mouth, and oh, they had, you know, 25 girls in there, the teacher in there at one time, um, eating tea and crumpets, and then <laughs> uh, they say, you know, a man could stand a full height with his top hat inside the whale's mouth, and wow. they we had men there eating oysters, and and they and they took this whale and they they dragged it all up and down the east coast hitting all the major cities and they did that for 2 years and, and huh. apparently making money off of this. Oh well, sure. And and they had this this um it was like a I don't know, I'm trying to remember I think it was a dime, you know, to to get in. Right, and, right. And and there was an offer that you could get your money back if you could prove it wasn't a real whale and nobody ever asked that but so after two years, they decided that, you know, they'd done all the cities on the coast and they were going to head up the canal because if, if they went up the canal, there'd be people who'd never seen a whale before. Sure. And um, there's a problem, and that is like, they'd involved the whale two years ago and the thing was getting kind of ripe, you know. And, <laughs> <laughs> and so every stop, they had to add some more embalming fluid and usually what was available was whiskey so every mm. stop they'd go in and they'd buy a bunch of whiskey and they'd you know recoat the thing and but people came for miles and 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 now at that point, at the point in time um train systems were running so you didn't even have to live on the canal you could take a train in and go mm, see the whale right. and so they were going from excuse me city to city and you know all the people were coming and you know dining in the whale's mouth and so on and <laughs> and and so finally they they get to um to waterloo and something happened there it's it's a little strange and, and it there's two stories you know it's just like the, right, the origination right. of the story there's two stories of what happened and once some, somebody put stuck a stick of dynamite in the whale's mouth and whale blubber blew all over the city of waterloo and <laughs> and the other said that you know somebody set fire to the whiskey soaked whale mm. but either way there was some vandalism okay and but nonetheless, they, they thought they had, you know, a good deal. They were going to continue on. In of fact, Ro- they set their sights on Rochester. And um, the unfortunately, the Rochester Health Department caught wind of this, and they, they put a stop to that. They said they cannot take this whale up the Seneca Cayuga Canal. So they backed the whale back down the canal and out into Lake Ontario. Mm. And well, you know how it is around here. The weather can change just like that. And, sure. and that's what happened. A storm came up and boom, the whale, the whale sunk. And there, <laughs> so, you know, even today they say there, there, you know, there remains of the whale that's on the bottom of Lake Ontario. Somewhere. Somewhere. <laughs> What's left of it anyway. <laughs> that's just bizarre for anyone to even think that <laughs> up in the first place. But I, I can, you know, the poster's there. I, I, you know, I wouldn't believe it myself, but, you know. Oh <laughs> uh, well, I thank you for coming and uh, sharing these stories with us. And uh, you do have four books. The first is Central New York and the Finger Lakes: Myths, Legends, and Lore, which a lot of these stories were taken from. Uh, and the other ones are what? 
I have um, Curiosities of Central New York and Forgotten Tales of New York and Curiosities of the Finger Lakes. Yes, and the last time we were on, we dealt with Curiosities of the Finger Lakes. We did. All right, and people, if they want to find you online, you do puppet shows as well as sell your books where? Well, the, the books are actually at Barnes & Noble. If, if, it, if they're not on the shelf, um, then they can order them. You can also order on Amazon, or you can order them at my own website. That's www.thepuppets, which is plural, dot com. All right. Uh, next week, uh, I believe next week, is Aaron Gullius and Mike Cleland returning for part uh, 700 of UFO history. I don't know what we were actually up to, maybe five. We'll be dealing with the 1990s. And, uh, yeah, again, check out our Patreon. I have a midweek podcast going up this week with Red Pill Junkie, Joshua Cutchin, and Mike Hughes, and some other really cool stuff coming up. So, if you were a patron, you'd already have that interview, but uh, otherwise, you'll get it this week. Extra stuff is available on uh, com, and for patrons only.